Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eduardo Martins. I'm a research associate at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about birds and mammal movements. I'm going to switch gears for a bit and talk about uh, movements of fish. So this talk is going to be about fine scale movements of a, a species of salmon. It's a bull trout uh, in, a in an environment that is quite dynamic. It's uh, the forebay of a hydropower reservoir. Uh, before we start, we'd like to acknowledge the contribution of all my co-authors being a tremendous amount of support. Uh, it's been amazing uh, work and learn from them. Also, would like to thank all the other people and institutions that have uh, helped us along the way. It's been, we, we wouldn't be able to, to do this work uh, without them. And just before I start talking about our, uh, how we con conduct this study and uh, what we've been observing uh, um, the movement of ball trout, I just wanted to motivate to you, show you what motivates us uh, to do this work. And uh, the issue that motivates us is this issue called fish entrainment. And this cartoon represents really well what it, what it is. It's basically the displacement of fish from reservoirs to downstream waters through uh, turbine or any type of water intake structure. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, it's an uh, important conservation issue for hydropower companies and regulating agencies because uh, entrainment causes injury and mortality of fish. And at a population level, it can lead to reduction of the abundance of upstream populations and, and or an increase in the abundance of downstream populations if the fish manage to survive uh, the entrainment uh, event. Uh, this is an issue that has been relatively well studied for downstream migrating fish, such as sal salmon moats or eels, but much less understood for uh, resident species uh, in reservoirs, including uh, several species that are important fishery resource uh, in these uh, environments. But they actually can get entrained if they happen to use uh, habitats near turbine intakes during turbine, uh, turbine operations. So. The general objectives of our work were to investigate the entrainment vulnerability of resident fish, and we are focusing here on adult fish, uh, by studying their movement ecology throughout the reservoir, which I'm not going to be talking about because don't, we don't have time. I'm going to be focusing on the movement ecology of those fish in the Fort Bay area, uh, which is the area just upstream of the dam or, or powerhouse. And we also conduct modeling of the intake-induced flows in this Fort Bay area, and I'm going to show you at the beginning, uh, at the end of this talk, we're starting to integrate these biological and hydraulic components to get a better understanding of how the fish move in response to the intake-induced flows. And generally uh, answer the, fact, the, the questions of what are the factors that, are, that influence movement behavior of adult resident fish, and specifically looking at bull trout in the four bay and uh, therefore increasing entrainment rate uh, risk. So this is our study system. As I said, we're investigating um, entrainment of bull trout, a large salmonid native to the west, northwest in the U.S., western Canada. Our study sites located in this, look, in this area marked by the red star. Uh, the area is called the King Basket Reservoir. It's a reservoir that uh, is formed by these two reaches that meet it form this main pool. And here where you have this uh, red arrow is where, where the dam and the Fort Bay area are located and where we focused on this study. And downstream of that, you have Revelstoke Reservoir. So here you see an aerial photo of the area. Here's the dam. Downstream of that, you have Revelstoke Reservoir. And here's the Fort Bay area we're interested in. Specifically, here's the powerhouse and here's the area I'm going to be focused on this study. So how we conduct this study, we use positional telemetry based on acoustic, uh, um, Positional time based on acoustic, acoustic telemetry. So we, what we did was to tra tag about 85 bull trout, surgically implanted tags into them, and those tags they had a, a temperature and depth sensor, and they were transmitting signals every three to five seconds. Um, we are tracking them with these acoustic uh, receivers based on cell phone technology. Uh, it's a bit more advanced than the, the normal acoustic systems that we see more commonly around. Um, and here is how our array looked like. This is an area of about 200 by 300 meters, and the receivers are located in these um, points marked by the yellow circle. So how does the system work? It's quite similar to the system that Rand was talking about in this morning. It's based on the uh, difference in time of arrival of signals in each one of the receivers. So basically, the fish enters the array, the tag transmits a signal, the signal arrives at different times in those receivers. This is recorded. 
Uh, we download this data, we know the exact position of the receivers, put in a software, and based on the difference of arrival, uh, time of arrival, and the positioning of the receivers, this software calculated position. Nice system, but in reality, we, when we look at the data, that we can see that there's a substantial error uh, in positioning. And um, if, if you start and calculate, for example, ground speeds based on this data, you start seeing fish moving at dozens of meters per second, which is just not possible. And you also start seeing fish uh, moving onto land, which again, obviously not possible. So we have to be able to account for this error before starting making inference about the behavior of the fish in this area. Uh, rather than just excluding positions that are clearly erroneous, what we did was to apply state space models uh, to estimate the two uh, ball trout position from this data observed it there. I'm not going to go into the details of this model. I'm, uh, I'm, I believe most of you are familiar with this. This is a model that was published by Ian Johnson and collaborate, collaborators in 2005. It basically uh, models the movement with this uh, pr process equation which is a differential correlated random walk, basically mo modeling the movement process, process as a correlated random walk on the difference. And then you link this to an observation equation that describes how the data is observed. So here it's saying that the, data is, the, 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 the observed data is the, actual, is the true animal location plus some error. So differently from their, their study, we're not using uh, obviously the uh, error distribution for Argus tags. We actually use the error distribution that are estimated um, uh, using the data collected from our system. So what we did here in this study was uh, slightly extend their, their version uh, of their model because we're also interested in vertical movement. So we developed this process equation describing the vertical movement as an autocorrelated, uh, an autoregression model order one. So basically it's a correlated random walk uh, in the vertical dimension and link this to an observation equation to account for the error in the sensor reading. So those sensors are not perfect, they have some amount of error uh, when the, in the reading, so we want to account for that as well. Uh, so we started fitting those models, and what we observe is that in some cases, the state space uh, model estimates of position would fall into land. And that, would, we, that occurred because in many cases, fish were moving pretty close to the boundary between the water and the land. So we have to find a way to inform the model that there are locations that the fish cannot move to. But we had a challenge. One, uh, the challenge is that the boundary between water and land is not fixed. It's changing quite a bit over the year because the reservoir level, water levels changed by over 30 meters. So we had to be, be able to account for that as well. So what we came up with a relatively uh, simple solution, which we call the dynamic land mask, which requires bathymetry data and water surface elevation throughout the study period. Uh, so basically, the way it, it works is as follows. So those, those models, they are, fitted, they are fitted using a Bayesian approach. So what this entails is uh, sampling the posterior distribution, for example, for locations. So you take a sample of the posterior distribution of location. You look at where that sample falls in the bathymetry map. You look at the elevation, uh, the terrain elevation of that location, and see if that elevation is smaller than the water elevation at the time of the track. If it is, great, you accept the sample, otherwise you resample. Uh, then we also want to make sure that the model is not going to estimate the, the fish at a depth that they cannot be, say, below the bottom. They cannot be below the bottom so what, or above the water surface. So what we did first was truncate the sampling of the fish elevations by the water elevation at that, that point. And also uh, look at the sample for the elevation of that fish and compare uh, at that location that was uh, sample in the, by the DCRW, whether that elevation is above the bottom uh, of the area. So if it is above the bottom of the area, again, we accept the sample or the wise reject and keep um, repeating the procedure. So here are some estimates of positions for uh, those same tracks that I showed you. Um, they, as you can see here, they, they seem to, to to capture the movement pairs that are hinted by the data quite well, but now you have much better estimates of ground speed that are much more reasonable based on what we know of this fish. I'm not gonna go uh, show you how we ground truth the model because we don't have time, but the model 
again, based on this ground truth, where we estimated locations of a tag moving, and we knew the position of those tags, the model did a good job of estimating those, those locations as well. So what we did with these estimates, we took, took these estimates, separated them by seasons. We did some sort of resampling to remove the autocorrelation between um, uh, the sample locations, and we estimated these utilization distributions. So here in this, in this figure is what we have, these dark areas, which are the core areas of this utilization distribution. They include 50% of the volume of the distribution, and that we interpret as the area we're more likely to encounter the fish. And then we look at the spring and summer, what we see is that the fish are usually encountered over 100 meters away from the powerhouse, which is represented here by this uh, black box. Come the fall, we see fish using areas still away from the powerhouse, but now also including uh, areas just in front of the powerhouse. And especially in the winter, the fish are just sitting in front of the powerhouse. And that matches really well with what we had observed uh, a few years earlier in another study of the, the seasonal patterns of entrainment um, for those fish. So here you have a plot that shows you the seasons on the x-axis, cumulative entrainment on the y-axis, and here you can clearly see most of the entrainment events that we are observing occur in the fall uh, or the winter. So we can also, if you are familiar with the state space model developed by Johnson and all, uh, you also know that we can use those models to estimate um, uh, probability of being a given behavior. So here we, we one behavior that we are estimating, we are calling the exploratory behavior, is characterized by local relation between moves resulting in frequent turns at low speeds. And here have uh, an example of what the, the, the behavior would look like. And the other behavior that we are calling in the transiting behavior is characterized by high correlation between moves resulting in a persistent direction in relatively high speeds. Again, you can see one example of what that would look like. So we estimate the probability of being in the exploratory behavior for each one of the locations of those same tracks I showed you before. And again, it seems the model does a good job, where you see the fish move in a persistent direction. It has a low probability of being the exploratory behavior, re uh, represented here by the yellow color, and where the fish move uh, makes more frequent turns. We see the fish um, uh, having a higher probability of being the, in the exploratory behavior. So we took that information, we used a generalized additive mixed model to try and understand what factors were affecting the probability of being the exploratory behavior. And some of the putative factors that we use are body temperature, season, time of day of discharge. We applied model selection techniques, and what we found was that probability of exploratory behavior was better explained by body temperature and time of day. So here you have a plot of the additive effect of body temperature and the probability of being the exploratory behavior. And what this plot tells us is that Temperatures around 2 degrees and temperatures around uh, 10 degrees, the fish is more likely to be in the exploratory behavior. And the body temperatures around 6 degrees, the fish is more likely to be transient. And then we look at the same additive effect over time of the day. And what we see is that in the afternoon and throughout the night, the fish is more likely to be in exploratory behavior. And in the morning hours, the fish is more likely to be in a transient behavior. Great, we found some relationships between the probability of being a, a given movement behavior and a few uh, um, biotic and abiotic factors. But when we look at the amount of variability that is explained by the model, it's very low. It's just about 15%. So we want to know what other factors may be affecting the movement the behavior of the fish in the forebay. And the natural question is uh, how the, the water is flowing uh, as, they are, as the turbines are operating. And so here you just have an example of the output of a computational fluid dynamics model. Uh, and here you're seeing a velocity increasing from blue to, to the red. And here a track, and this is a common behavior that you observed in several tracks, is that the fish moving towards an area of high velocity where it gets to a point, it decides to move away from it. So this is in the XY dimension. I'm gonna, just going to show you uh, some other visualization you're starting to do. Uh, here you have the YZ plane. So here are the turbines, the water surface, the bottom. Uh, here's a polar plot that shows you uh, the length of those lines, shows you the speed that the fish is moving in that plane, uh, and the directions that they are moving. As you can see, fish is moving in all directions, uh, which is not surprising at several, uh, all sorts of uh, speeds. Here you have the speed and direction of the water flow. Again, not surprising. They are moving uh, in the direction of the turbines. But what 
uh, one issue to emphasize here and for you to, to notice is that fish are always moving in speeds that are much higher than the water the uh, intake induced flows that they are encountering. So these are not really challenging velocity. In fact, here the maximum velocity we see a fish moving is about 0.6 meters per second. And those fish, they are able to move over three times faster than that for short periods of time when they're using anaerobic uh, swimming, burst swimming away from an area. So are they responding to the flows? Uh, here in this other plot, what we have is the length of the, the, the lines is the water velocity they, they experience and the direction is the direction that they decided to move. And what this plot tells us is whenever, in most of the cases, whenever the fish is experiencing water velocity is greater than 0 0.05 meters per second, what it decides to do is go up. So here's a very uh, informative example. So here's a track of a fish starting over here. The fish is moving towards the powerhouse. When it approaches, it seems to slow down. And then we take a look at the, uh, what it's doing in the vertical dimension. And what it's doing is that at the beginning of the track, the fish moves uh, at, uh, is at about seven meters of depth. And it approaches the end and approaches the powerhouse. It, start, it counters water velocities, accelerating water velocity. So that at this point, we have four turbines that are fully operational. And then it, the fish decides to move up towards the surface. So just to sum up some take home messages I wanted to leave it with. Um, so we extended, we made a slight extension, extended version of the Johnson model, the state space model developed by Johnson collaborators that integrates horizontal and vertical movement. We also develop a dynamic land mass that informs the mob, model of the locations where the animal cannot move. And I see this can be applied to other uh, aquatic environments that show um, a, a great degree of water level fluctuations, such as reservoirs, flood plains, and coastal areas. In terms of our study, uh, our specific question in terms of entrainment, uh, what this study and others that we have conducted have, show, have shown is that both trout are more vulnerable to entrainment during the fall and the winter. Uh, our hypothesis is that uh, these fish are forged for kokanee uh, near, which is a non anonymous form of sockeye salmon, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Um, and they might be foraged for kokanee uh, in front of the powerhouse during the winter. We know from other studies that, in fact, these prey species tends to congregate near uh, dams during this time of the year. And finally, now we started to integrate movement tracks and the CFD output. Uh, the initial exploration of the data indicates that ball trout seem to avoid high velocity areas. And no, Please note the quotation marks. Those are not high velocities for, for those fish, but they do sense the acceleration field and they try to avoid it. And our next step is to quantify how they respond to the, this flow field. So uh, initially, we've been thinking of using mixed models to explore that, the step selection functions. I also was very happy to see uh, James Shepard talk on the uh, three-dimensional uh, home range. I think it can has the good potential to be applied to this data set as well, and linking this to the CFD data. So, but I'm completely open to suggestions. We have not firm uh, what we're gonna do yet. So if you have any suggestions, you have any type of experience doing similar types of analysis, I would welcome uh, any suggestions. So uh, I'm gonna leave you with that, and thank you for your attention. Questions for Eduardo? Yes? For the bull trout? Yeah. Yeah, so th the question was if there was any, there were any seasonal changes in abundance. Uh, we did not estimate abundance. Uh, we do know how many fish were using the four bay over season. So uh, in one of the studies, we did find more fish using uh, the four bay during the fall and the winter, and sp especially spending a lot more time than the other seasons. In this particular tracking study, we had a similar number of fish uh, that came to the four bay. Uh, in different seasons. But again, they spend different amounts of time. They spend a lot more time in, near the, the powerhouse in the fall and the winter. Yeah, so the question was if I looked at the other variables, uh, such as temperature and oxygen in the water, 
Uh, no, I didn't. Um, we do have temperature. Uh, we are measuring temperature data in the water column throughout the study period. We haven't looked into that yet. Uh, we don't have oxygen data. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, we, did, we didn't um, did any adjustments for that. Okay, thank you. Well, that thank concludes you. our session.